Hi, so yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, a project that we're going to perform with later on as well. Um, they're quite new ideas, they're sort of improvised, they're semi, essentially. Um, and in fact, we realised last night that they directly relate to the questions of the workshop, so that's fantastic. Um, I'm just going to give a really sh short intro to the, the, this ongoing project that Chris and I have been working for about a year. Um, and then Chris is going to talk about maybe some ideas about machine listening in the in the cellos and the feedback system, and then also in kind of wider culture and what we can learn from that and what we might like to think about. Um, very much open questions rather than any kind of fixed formal thesis. So I hope that's suitable for this setting. Um, so these 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 um, self-resonating feedback cello project, uh, as I say, we've been working on for about a year. It came out from meeting um, an Icelandic guy called Haldor, and his instrument on the far top right is a Haldorophone, following the Icelandic tradition of naming your instruments after yourself. Um, he's a, a wonderful artist and <coughs> brilliant 3D designer, fabricator. So he's been working on various models of these instruments for a little while. He's a good friend of our colleague Thor Magnusson, so we met him through Thor and saw a film of this, of this instrument. I grew up playing the cello and have always experimented with different ways of, of electro, electro acousticifying it, if you like, and uh, this was by far to me the most convincing that I'd come across. And so I approached him and said, well, look, do you think we could do a retrofit of an existing cello, kind of hack an acoustic cello? And he said, yes, that'd be a great idea, let's try it. So he came over to visit us last year, just before the Live Interfaces Conference, and Chris and I both bought uh, uh, a suitably um, a suitable cello, let's say, um, to, to, to dismember. So the basic idea is there's a whole family now of, of, of feedback resonator instruments. Um, instead of using the, 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 the bow, as, as Paul just was, to mechanically vibrate the, the string, which then passes vibrations down through the bridge into the body, which then resonates, we flick the whole thing round. So there's pickups, electromagnetic pickups, under the strings. They, pick, they, they take the signal which are then, is then amplified and can be modified, which is what Chris will talk about, is um, amplified and then sent to a speaker or transducer that's built into the cello body. So that, that then vibrates the cello body up through, and, then, and then up through the bridge, which caused the strings to vibrate. So you get a self-resonating system. So we, um, we bought some cellos and we cut holes in them um, very carefully at first and then with machines as it got later into the night. Um, but not in a fairly brutal, but we then very carefully and lovingly fitted a, a spruce um, backplate and speaker built into the back of the body. So that's the kind of that's the, the, the sound, um, the, 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 the sounding mechanism. But there's also we also use transducers on the front, and then we designed a, a and Haldor made us a beautiful 3D uh, 3D printed pickup mount. So these are electromagnetic pickups which sit under each string, and you can control very carefully the position of those. That's the basic system, and then there's, there's, there's quite huge complexities due to the physical body, but also then you can take that signal and then process it through supercollider, which is what Chris will talk about. Um, we've explored these in a number of different settings. We're very much interested in this kind of continuity between the purely acoustic gestural instrument, and so I'm coming to it from that way. How do you start with a cello and introduce generative, longer-term electronic and digital processes. And Chris's background as a, as a computer musician is, well, what if we start off with synthesis and then make increasingly complex um, modulators or resonators for that synthesis? So it's this kind of nice meeting point. We've been exploring things along that continuum. So we started off as a cellist and live coder, where Chris was completely separate from the cello, and I was m m quite hands-on. We also explored then looking at it as a kind of extended technique within the cello tradition, and then we've explored it as a completely kind of autonomous instrument where, where both the systems are just listening to each other and, and processing that signal. Then the whole room be kind of becomes live. So people walked into this, it's um, a Napoleonic fort built into a cliff on the, up in, the, in New Haven where I live. Um, people walked into the room and instantly recognised that they responded, so it might be coming silently and then their footstep causes the whole thing to trigger and start screaming at them. So we've been exploring this kind of continuum, basically, of this is an instrument which you fully control or is fully autonomous, and then the kind of bit of uncontrol or agency, distributed agency in, in between, and what does that mean, and how do you learn to play it, and what can you do with it? Those are the sorts of, very roughly, the questions. We then, we, we then had another... Um, 
kind of round two, version two update, we went, thanks to Erasmus, went and visited Haldor in his studio in Reykjavik, and we kind of did the next round of development. So I fitted some sympathetic strings onto mine and brought some more sliders in to control the game, and more significantly, Chris has developed, brought, instead of sitting at his laptop and occasionally touching the cello, now the cello is his whole control interface. So you'll meet these instruments in the concert this evening. Um, one line of, of inquiry that we're thinking of developing is, is to think of these, take these seriously, if you like, as kind of dynamical systems, as a way of understanding which, which feedback tones dominate or understanding um, how to balance and interact with this quite, quite complex system. So it's a very late night drawing. <laughs> um, what we've got <coughs> normally within a, in a cello, right, the state of the cello is totally determined by the cellist. So the cello, the cellist controls the cello, yeah? So that's, yeah. Um, but then what we've done is put this, this, this speaker with this feedback system in, which is in some ways, as Paul's saying, this is, can be thought to be listening. In some sense, this is listening. It's an analog system. It doesn't, it's not actively listening. We might talk about that as in implicit listening. We've got this, this, this feedback system. And what that's doing then is, the cello is no longer just a function of the cellist. The cello is also a function of the cello, right? So just with that very simple coupling, we start to get this. And as we, we can have, if we had a coefficient between each of these terms, then you've got this balance of control, if you like, where the cellist, is the cellist in control? Is the cello in control? How do they negotiate that control in a kind of, we might say this is a way of understanding distributed agency. Like as this system becomes more complex, you're, you're negotiating with it. You're no longer kind of intimately controlling it. So I'm just going to talk a bit about where we use machine listening in the, in the process of uh, uh, making sound with these instruments. Uh, this machine listening happens as a part of a feedback system, and so we've got some questions about what does it mean when you've got machine listening within a feedback system, what kind of questions should we, we be asking. Uh, and then I'll kind of zoom out a bit and think about machine listening kind of more generally as feedback in within feedback systems and how that affects or could affect their design. So just a really quick review, uh, feedback systems, we've got one or more really strongly coupled dynamical systems. So in the case of the cellos, we've got, uh, we've got some sound processing at its own dynamical system, and then the cellos themselves are dynamical systems. We might have little dynamical systems within those systems as well. We've got a circular argument going on, so we've got a signal flowing around. It's pretty hard to tell where that argument starts and ends. So it's very kind of emergent, complex behaviour that we get. Uh, each of these systems acts as a filter, so they emphasise or de-emphasise aspects of their state. And as the state kind of circulates through, certain aspects of that state will get emphasised. Uh, for example, if you stick a distorted guitar in an amp, you get screaming feedback because a certain frequency has been, uh, has been emphasised. So within the cellos, this is an example of, uh, of how we might use uh, machine listening. And w there's various different ways that we, that we program these cellos. Uh, this is a kind of more, sh more machine listening based patch. Uh, it's written in Superclub as the code there if anyone's interested, but diagrams are probably easier. So we've got, some st we've got the strings, we've got individual pickups on the strings, and then individual gains on those strings. Uh, and in this patch, uh, we've got an amplitude follower. So that's a pretty simple machine listening device. But within a complex feedback system, we get a lot of things for free. Uh, so we don't really need to do much to get kind of interesting emergent behavior. In fact, I could probably spend years exploring this, these few lines of code and probably never really discover the full, full uh, kind of uh, extent of it. So we've, we've got some amplitude following going on. Uh, and here is a saturation uh, module. So what this tries to do, it, uh, it kind of monitors the signal with varying sensitivity and tries to maximise the energy of the signal. Uh, so that's its own kind of, kind of dynamical system, trying to force up all the energy. Uh, and then we've got a crossfader here. And what happens is, depending on the, uh, the volume, the kind of general volume of each string, we crossfade between a saturated state and a non-saturated state. So what happens is basically, they kind of we're trying to push up the energy in the system, but as soon as that energy gets too much, it tries to squash it down again. So it kind of tries to transition over just to a normal state. And then you get this really complex kind of interplay uh, and kind of natural oscillation 
between saturation and unsaturation. So just this very simple uh, system can be very, very complex and interesting emergent behaviour. Uh, so the machine listening is a key part of this. So we have to kind of monitor the input and generate a control signal from it in order to, to kind of control the dynamics of the system. But it's just an amplitude follow or four amplitude follows. So it's pretty, pretty simple. So we, we're trying to think where's the machine, or what's the kind of nature of the machine listening here. So we've got some explicit machine listening. We've got an amplitude follower. So, that's a, so it's tracking the, the volume with a, with a certain kind of release and attack. But there's also some implicit listening going on here. Because once you're in a feedback loop, it's quite difficult to kind of separate out what's doing what. Each, all the controls are kind of so codependent that we can't really separate them out. So we've got some gains here. And rather than being a, so the gains are on each string, and rather being, than being a kind of simple, uh, kind of like a fader on a mix, <coughs> when they're within a feedback system, they become more of a channel of energy, so a concentration of energy in certain directions, which uh, and through certain paths, if strengthened, will kind of generate more feedback. So, in a way, that's a kind of way of directing the focus of the system. So it's a kind of an Im implicit listening, if you like. So we're, we're trying to separate it out into kind of explicit and implicit here. So you get this listening for free, if you like. So zooming out, we're having a kind of thought experiment about what happens in kind of real-world ma machine listening scenarios, uh, how are they embedded within feedback systems. So here's a really simple example. I don't know if you can see the font here, but we've got a DJ beat tracking system. So uh, we've got beat induction, on a, we're trying to, trying to kind of uh, beat match some records. We've got an LED readout on each, uh, <coughs> each CD, say, and we're trying to kind of match the tempo. So we've got a machine listening system that, uh, that tells us what tempo it is, and then the DJ can respond to that and kind of adjust. So we've got a kind of simple feedback system here. Uh, a speech recognition system. So a person can speak. Uh, if it's a good speech recognition system, it'll understand. If it doesn't, uh, the person might adjust the way they change their input. So they might speak more like a newsreader or something to, to get the system to understand. So we've got a feedback loop going on here because uh, the output of the system is affecting the future input. This is probably a, a bit more relevant, really. Uh, so recommender systems. So uh, the work of David Beer talks about this as well. We've got recommender systems which are using machine listening and they're kind of shaping culture a bit because they, they recommend music to people, which um, then they're more likely to buy it, possibly. That might in turn affect the music that people are more likely to make because they think it will sell more. So we've got a feedback loop going on there, the kind of a mimetic feedback loop, which we'll talk about later. And uh, the last one. So uh, thinking about, in the last workshop, we did some uh, an analysis of oral history archives. So using machine listening. Uh, if we get some particularly interesting results, that might sensitise historians to certain research topics, and then which kind of we get another feedback loop here, which might affect future data, which people then analyse. So to wrap up, uh, we've got some questions really. So, is it really important that we think about machine listening within the context of wider feedback loops, whether they're kind of a real time or kind of cultural time, mimetic time? Uh, longer time scales. Uh, we have to accept that machine listening algorithms are kind of tunable, uh, biased filters, so in some way their output might affect their future input in certain situations. And within feedback loops, we've got explicit listening, so things like machine learning, uh, kind of focused algorithms that we, we've designed to have particular output. But because of this feedback processing, we might have kind of uh, implicit listening going on as well. So is it important to separate those two things out? Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you.